So when you think of someone who is addicted to methamphetamines, meth in the US, in Australia it's known as ice, what do you think about? If you pictured what an ice addict looks like or a meth addict, what do they, what do they look like? What does their life look like? Where do they live? What's their job, if they even have one? What's the relationship they have with their family? What's the image that comes to your mind when you think of that? You've probably got a pretty clear picture already. I'll bet that that picture is not a successful middle-aged man with a beautiful home near the beach, a man who has three beautiful daughters that he is the father to. I'll also bet that you didn't picture Australian surfing royalty, Tom Carroll. But at one point, that is exactly what Tom's life had become. In the world of professional surfing, Tom Carroll is a legend. Through the 80s and 90s, he dominated the professional surfing tour, becoming the first surfer to sign a multi-million dollar contract. In 1983 and 1984, twice he achieved the pinnacle of his sport. He became world champion back to back. He is one of the rare surfers who has scored two perfect tens during one heat of competition. What's wilder, both of those perfect tens were on the wave at Pipeline in Hawaii on gigantic five meter tubes of death. So he made both of those scores, those incredible achievements with the very real threat that his life could end any millisecond absolutely present. Tom is an incredible athlete still, but it is what Tom has achieved out of the water, which is possibly even more incredible. In today's episode, Tom and I talk about how he found himself sliding down the slippery slope of addiction and how that addiction began to take everything that he loved away from him. How that addiction had him trapped in a cycle of drug abuse that was heading towards a very grim end. But Tom knew that he needed help and thankfully he was able to get that help. And it was at South Pacific Private that Tom first got help. Now, I'm no stranger to talking about recovery from drugs and alcohol. It's a part of my story. It's a huge reason why I started this show, because I didn't know that not drinking and using was actually an option. I wanted to have conversations out there which could demonstrate that there was an alternative and that help was available if you needed it. And I certainly needed to hear these kind of conversations when I was struggling. And I'm grateful that I can be a part of bringing conversations like this into the public eye or ear, depending on where you're getting this episode. And because of that, I am very grateful and proud to partner with South Pacific Private to bring you this episode today. South Pacific Private is Australia's leading treatment center and has been treating the underlying causes of addiction, anxiety, and depression in Australia for over 30 years. If that sounds like something you're interested in, you can actually take a free self-assessment for a variety of conditions on their website, southpacificprivate.com.au. And if you need them, their team is available to chat seven days a week, 1-800-063-332. Now, Tom Carroll is a recovering addict, and his journey of redemption is nothing short of inspiring. It's a story of resilience, of strength, and finding hope in even the darkest of times. He's an incredibly wise man. And look, even if you do not have a problem with any substance or, or gambling or any other kind of addiction, the wisdom that Tom has to share about the effects of untreated trauma and what it, what it really means to take responsibility for your choices and for your situation is it's absolutely transformative and super powerful. And I really hope you can listen to that part. Enjoy this conversation with Tom Carroll. <laughs> We made it. We made it. Osha. So mm. happy you're here, Tom. It's good to be here. Actually, Thank last you. time I, I, you actually came to my house. I came to your house. Yeah. And you have the, you have the freaking Bonsai Pipeline trophy, which yeah. is a big hat <laughs> at your place. And I tried not to freak out when I saw it. <laughs> it's been a minute. It is. That podcast was really important. I, that was for the Movember podcast. Mm. And um, I know enough to know that. Just because I can't see it doesn't mean it's not possible. So all I need to do is talk to people who are where I want to be, that were once mm. where I was. And at the time, I was struggling really hard with suicidality and stuff like mm. that. So I, I pitched my vendor. I said, we should do a podcast about suicide prevention. They're like, great, we'll team you up with some own messes. I'm like, brilliant. But what I ended up doing mm. then 
which is kind of what I wanted to do, I started talking to survivors, suicide survivors. Yes. And like sitting down face to face or connecting over a, wow. a call and being able to hit, because mm. I didn't, there was no meetings for that. Yeah. You know, but I knew that worked. Mm. I knew what it is to sit and have someone tell me it's going to be okay, even though you can't see it yeah. right now. Your brain is telling me there's no other way for it to work. Mm. It can. Just do this. Don't worry about next year. Mm. Don't worry about next month, next week. Mm. Just today. Do this and come talk to me tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Same resolution, really, isn't it? Like, um, if you want to resolve this, it's sort of you don't want to give all your demons a chance. So you've, the, the hack is just to be now, and then you do, and just act now on what you need to do. Yeah, and that so, might be nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I was so actually when I came to your house, I was I was still pretty unwell. Mm. It took me quite a while, um, but you know it was a long hike in. So it's well, it good to be here and see you, man. I'm I'm so You're glad. Well, I'm so. Mm. Mm. You know, 13 years, six months, and I don't know how many days Fantastic. now. And just mm. trying to, you know, it's the same thing that my man told me on day one. He goes, look, buddy, all you got to do is get to bed tonight without mm. drinking or using. Don't mm. hurt yourself or anybody else. Um, if you make a mistake, try to make it better. Get help if you need it and try to help somebody else. If you do that, go to bed tonight. You've done it perfectly, as perfectly as anybody. Mm. Get up tomorrow mm. and do the same thing. Is that it? Yeah, that's it. Okay. Like there was more to it, obviously. But yeah. Well, uh, things unfold. Life comes on. Yeah. It's like, yeah. and that's just kind of mm. it. And that mm. pathway, I didn't believe it would work. But it. Who does? No. In that no, space. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then they ask you to believe in high power. <laughs> it's like, what are you talking about? Oh, you might. And then they, then they, and if you bring the God word out and you, that's really tricky. Well, For I really me. struggled. I really struggled with yeah, that. Yeah. You know, because of the school I went to and yeah, various experiences yeah. when I was younger, I was like, nah, not interested. And you can see it going on all around the world right now, you know, like right, right at this very moment. Oh, it's, it's God. Oh, da, 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 da. It goes on and on. Yeah. And it's the human experience is, is you go, oh, my God. You go, oh, my God. <laughs> they're using, <laughs> they're using uh, that word again. But it's, so, just, it's, just, mm. uh, it's just, yeah, it's... It has shaped so much of our society, but it eventually, again, I listened to a lot of stuff around then and I heard a story about a guy that would use his tractor. He was a farmer and he used his tractor because his man, his sponsor just basically said, I don't care, just got to pick something bigger than you. So he picked <laughs> his tractor because without his tractor, he couldn't feed his family, couldn't look after his land, couldn't keep that roof over their head. And so respected this thing, did right by it, and it's like whatever it is, mate. And you can care for a tractor. Just pick something bigger than yeah, you. Yeah. Pick something bigger than you, and that's it. And um, it's, <laughs> that's it's a great so, story, isn't it? That's amazing. And, and just like your vehicle or something that you or anything that you care for, you can animate it in the mind. Yeah. So it just animates and it, it does its thing. And I mean, if you look at something for long enough, it starts to animate. It's naturally it. You know, I've got, I'm a father of three daughters, watching them do their thing and just being able to be there to support them now, particularly now, being able to support um, and be there and just, uh, you know, they, they just get out there and do their stuff. They want to do good things. It's just that's the innate thing in us humans. We do want to do good things. Yeah. Sometimes we take it a little far, but, you know. No, we generally skewed. do. It's built into us. Yeah. We come out like that. Mm. When they were little, did you, like, at what point did they realise that dad had a different job? Like, when just endless amounts of men would come up to you and want to <laughs> shake your hand, people that you didn't know? I think it was um, pretty soon because uh, I was, you know, I was doing the tour. Yeah. When the first two came, I was on tour with, with Jenna, who's now 31, um, and 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 me became two Mimi or Amelia who came in uh, two years like to the day later. Wow. Uh, she and they they both were on the tour with me for a couple of years, wow. trying to change nappies and just travel. And it was they just got too much. We surrendered. Lisa and I, my ex-wife and their mother, surrendered to okay. If I want to keep the tour. Um, you, 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 you know, we're going to have to split up here for a while. And, and, and I thought, I just can't 
be without. And I, I found it hard to be full, aggressive, uh, competitive mode, competition mode, and and on the tour and not be close by. And so I found it really hard. And then actually coming home was even harder, <laughs> harder, <laughs> because the structure wasn't there anymore. And so yeah, it was right. very tricky. Yeah, it was a very tricky time. There's a as as much as mm. I'm not a fan of the things that those guys have done. There's a book by a band called Motley Crue. And yeah. There's a line from Tommy Lee that says, "I wish someone wrote a book. What to do now? You've come home from tour." Bingo. Because mm. I read that and I went, "Yes." Mm. Because you go from this humongous amount of yeah. stimulation, mm. and you know, for me, it's just it was just stimulation for you. It was that and. I might die. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> trying and, there's, to win this. and there's a strong purpose. Yeah, the strong sense of purpose. Yes. You know, there's not, a big comedy not, check that's going to pay and for the kids' Christmas presents. And it, yeah, and over, it overrides uh, the family to some degree, you know, like because your ego has been stroked so far with it. So all of a sudden you think you're like, well, they've got to kind of do what i got to do, you know. Yeah. And then you just go, hang on, they, they can't. And then, you, then there's a tearing. <laughs> A kind of a tearing in, yep. in the guts, like it's yeah. right in there. Mm. It's it's ex- extraordinary. Mm. When, when I mean, we're, we're here talking because, and I'm grateful we're able to do this because the, the first time we spoke, I don't think I was quite, I wasn't really in the space or able really to, to have the conversation to the, you know, how I would like to have it with you today. Mm. But, but at any point, if there's a stuff you don't want to talk about, I'm not here to do anything sensational. But there's the thing that in Australia, um, you know, we, people may not realise how much help there is for addiction. And you told me last time we spoke, you, t- you told me about the, the work that was being done at South Pacific Private and it sounded very much like the kind of stuff that I heard from the, the upper end of the ethical spectrum of rehab in the States. There's a very, very terribly low end. Yes. <laughs> as I'm sure yeah. there is everywhere. But it made me incredibly happy to know that that was there mm-hmm. because of all the things to try to come back from, methamphetamines is like that is, it Ooh. just fucks your brain. It totally rewrites shit. Mm. And to know that that help is available for people, that it's even here is amazing. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> that moment for me when I uh, when I was assessed, I was informed by my sponsor in NA, which I couldn't get you know, clean what he called on the streets because it, you, you just had too many masks between me and you. I just had too much stuff yeah. to try and cope with my reality that was so well, well, well orchestrated, articulately put put into place that I couldn't sort of see through myself. Uh, so he was saying, "Look, Tommy, you'll need to get some distance from the substance, substances because, you know, a few months going in and out of the room, rooms saying I'm clean and you know, all, all the spinning the stories <laughs> trying to say I'm high as a kite, right? And and um, and and that tearing apart of that self um, at that point, some glimmer of, like, conscience was saying, okay, Tom, what, what my sponsor was saying was right. Okay, there's some part of me, just a little, mm. little spark. And and so that's when I, I went and got assessed to go into South Pacific and um, that was in uh, like November um, 2006 and they gave me a date of December 18. Whoa. I told my daughters who were then 13 and 15 uh, and, you know, with my, my ex-wife and, you know, and the fear in her eyes was enough for me to kind of go, whoa. What am I doing? You know, like, and the distance that I was creating between me and my daughters, you know, just by just trying to cope, yeah. um, hiding this sort of drug use and 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 this addiction, you know, yeah. which was overrunning. And as you know, it just it just gets bigger in the dark. It just sort of grows and grows in the dark, as it does, like a whole bunch of fungi. <laughs> and you know, I remember bawling. Uh, it it cracked. Uh, finally, started crying and. All this stuff started coming out with this lady. She assessed me and she said, oh, you're definitely, uh, we're going to um, give you the date. Uh, I can give you December 18. It was a five-week program back then. Mm-hmm. So it we went over Christmas. and so. How many that, days between that day uh, and well, check-in? I had like, I had a trip to the US to do uh, with my sponsor, Quicksilver. Things got pretty hectic 
in the US. I got out of there via Tahiti to go surfing on the way back home. Got pretty, got pretty crazy. I got back home, landed on the ground, and then, you know, we had this young, beautiful little daughter, you know, Grace, who come into the world, <clears throat> who I'd been you I've been using to try and cope with everything around me. Yeah. And all the speed uh, of of action and and I just couldn't sort of cope. So I was trying to use something that kind of helped me feel like I was coping, which was working for a while, right? And uh, this beautiful little girl, and, and it was just very, very hectic in my house at that time. A lot of action, a lot of trying to deal with what was going on. And Grace was, back then, was it, it, she didn't appear graceful to me because of my inner experience. She was like a baseball bat over the head. And she'd go, dad, 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 like trying to get my attention. I'm like, what this? Yeah, yeah. And I remember Lisa knew that, Lisa knew, my ex-wife knew that this was what had to happen and it was going in the right direction, even though it just seemed like hell. And she goes, but right at the last moment, she goes, you know, I think it's December 16 or something, she goes, can you just do it after Christmas, like because of Christmas? And I've just gone, no. Because in the back of my head, if I don't do it now, it's not going to happen. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, I could go anywhere from here. Mm. And from what I've just been doing, and I've been taking it, because you just want to use more. You, yeah. you just want to pile as much as you can into you because not only do you think it's the end, uh, so addiction becomes on, it comes on stronger into the system. So active addiction was very powerful at that point, and I fell into... South Pacific in December 18, Bloody uh, 2006. That, that little gap of light, I can <laughs> absolutely relate to that. Yeah. Like when I was at my sickest, that's it was just like, well, everything else is darkness mm. and that's the same as always mm. and it's just getting darker. But that, if I mm. just go and try and let go in that direction just for a second mm. and see what's there. And ultimately that's the thing that mm. but I was I, lucky. I, yeah, yeah, you know. And, and it wasn't me kind of wanting to do it, like I didn't even know I wanted to be clean. I didn't even yeah. know. I just because that's what I did. I've been doing it for years and I've been acting out in this in this disease for a long time. Yeah. And uh, in and out, in and out of it, trying to wrestle it to the ground, yeah. uh, wrestle myself to the ground. Like, <laughs> but it, internally. It, whatever substance it is, addiction's addiction. Yeah. All right? And it could be process addiction, could be pokies, mm. could be shopping, could be sex, it mm. could be alcohol, which it was for me. It was beer, you know. Yeah. It's it's not hard spirits. It's not, you know, you know, it was, mm. but it's, that wasn't my, my weapon of choice. It doesn't really matter what it is. Mm. It there is eventually no amount of it that will be enough. You know, and for me, it was like many things at once <laughs> as well. Yeah. It was everything at the same yeah. time. And you're right, it works until it doesn't, mm. you know, but the dosage or the amount you need to get mm. it to work is just a little further away yeah. every single time. Do you remember, I mean, I remember the first time I smelled, had a beer, it was like, this is it. It's the magic potion. I feel I can walk into a party full of people. I feel I feel brilliant. Hooray. I found it. And do you remember the first time when it was like, oh, hang on, no. This this might be causing me issues. It seems to be happening every time. Things get bad. Uh, it was a while, long time before that. Uh, you know, back in the late eighties, um I was um uh exposed to a lot of cocaine and uh and at once, just at this in Hawaii, actually, and there was a place where I never associated with so so much like the, the hard drugs, and and uh, there was a lot of there's a friend of mine who was a dealer, and it was just very plentiful, mate. And, uh, you were who you were in mm, that scene. Mm, I can tell you, like, and I just I just talk about mm, this a bit. Like, I think I maybe bought that kind of drug mm, maybe twice. Mm, it was always around. Yeah. Hey, mate, hey, I've yeah. left something in there for yeah, you. Just, could, would you, yeah. Yeah, just would you, be my honor, let me. Yeah. Like, sure. Yeah, okay. I'll, you just, take, just take that, you know. <laughs> just, yeah, I'll give you that. You just take, that's for you. I go, what, what, that thing? I go, what am I going to do with that? And it, <laughs> and I, uh, and it's the ego drug, right? Right. It's the ego drug. So if you've got, you're just pumped up. You're just thinking you're killing it, like, um, 
straight away almost, almost instantly. It's very instant. But it's got the up and down very quick and Yeah, yeah. Uh and 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 I got pretty caught up in that. Uh in particularly I think it's around mid eighties, like ninety I mean uh um eighty five, eighty six winter when uh, the the tour had finished there and I spent a l- just a little bit more time there and things kicked into gear and it was quite quite a um, quite a load on. That was second year I was exposed to that same person and and um, this person he just got more and more and more it was like incredible amounts and I it just was it got to a point uh, where I just couldn't I had to get off the island and get on a flight and get out of there. And I'd get home and go, oh, my God. It'd be just before New Year's. I'd just I'd missed Christmas at home. I'd be, like, cr- crawling off the plane going, oh, my God, I got home. And, and I'd just and I'd, and I'd just pull myself together and I'd go, okay, for the next few months I'm just going to get myself together and get back on this, yeah. you know, what I love doing, which is, yeah. you know, on the on the tour and surfing and, and pull myself together. So... And then I'd work towards becoming successful again at what I was doing. And you get a little bit of success, you get a couple of really peak moments, and then party time. So so the, the roller coaster began yeah. in essence there. And and it's not like you know, is I I really got once I was sort of in South Pacific and I started getting exposed to and I was ready for it, by yeah. the way. It was I didn't know it. But I was finally kind of opened up to, okay, uh, I'm 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 away from everything, I can just fall apart here. I felt like I was starting to fall apart, and I was cr- I was cracked open, you know. And I love that Leonard Cohen song, you know, the the one where you know there's a crack in everything. And I don't know enough Leonard Cohen. I only know the one about Berlin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the way, yeah, he talks about the crack. There's a crack in everything. Right. That's where the light gets in, <laughs> you know. And so, you know, it's beautiful and it made a lot of sense, you yeah. know, and here I am. I'm cracked and uh, I was open to, you know, sort of looking back inside, which I wasn't, I couldn't mm. look back. <laughs> I couldn't look back. I was trying as fast as I could away from myself the other yeah. way. Now I, had a, now I just naturally wanted to come back in yeah. and start to look at, what was behind all this for me, and um, and because I I didn't like looking at my daughters and thinking that they're in the way of me using, you know, I didn't like that feeling. It was like it was tearing me up and it was dislocating, and uh, I'm sure it showed up as a great idea when it did. Well, then see, see, all of a sudden they're not human. Yeah, right. I lose the the humanness of my daughters, which is just. Uh, it's so sad that moment, you know. It's it's a very sad, sad, and and, and I know it when it, you know it when it's happening because there's still that flicker of consciousness because you're you're awake, <laughs> you're seeing it, but you override it with the addiction. So the addiction has to come on stronger yeah. to survive. And there's, the addict's always trying to survive, right? So it, it'll and it starts using everyone and everything, <laughs> right? Yeah. So finally cracked, you know. And in that in that addict space, you you got to you, you're really wrapping yourself with a whole bunch of armor, yeah, to try and survive. Yeah. And so you, you can't get in there, the person to get in there to get to let let the light in. You need to crack, right? <laughs> there's there's so mm. much about though that mm. that you know the, the 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 biggest symptom of addiction is convincing it that's not there, <laughs> and that it will defend itself as you just described so wonderfully. It'll defend itself at all costs, yeah. and you'll find yourself justifying things mm. more and more and more. And uh, I talk about this when I when I speak on stage about this kind of stuff. Mm. I'm like, I remember like a Tuesday, mm. I don't know, it's like two p.m. I'm day drinking, I'm playing two tables of internet poker, mm. gambling hundreds of dollars an hour away with two, I was fancy, I had two screens, yeah. <laughs> you know, there, 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 while furiously masturbating to increasingly yeah. more intense porn yeah. over here yeah. while I was waiting for the hands to deal. And if someone called me, what are you doing? I was like, oh, I was just hanging out at home, mate. It's just Tuesday. <laughs> See, it's it's like it, it like at best it's insane, right? It's ridiculous. <laughs> That's what I when I heard this 
speaker, this Mark L from California is talking on a the speaker tape when I first started hearing speaker tape. He talked about this this uh, addiction at best is ridiculous, right? At best. At worst is death. So what we're working with as a human in under the influence of our addict is ridiculous to death. <laughs> it's not much. <laughs> not much going on. <laughs> and, and highly destructive. So yeah. yeah. And so from looking from the outside, you just go, what the hell is this? I couldn't crazy? understand why no one wanted to come over, Tom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, this was great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, do you, like when you think like now, I mean, that made perfect sense for me mm. to do at that point. And mm. I think this is the thing for, and, you know, you spoke mm. about your daughters, so this is the thing I think for family of al- alcoholics and addicts to really understand mm. is like that is the best option they have available to them right now. Mm. They probably know full well how dangerously and destructive it is to themselves and to their relationships and to everyone around them. They literally don't have anything else to do except for that. That is the best Mm. choice they can make right now. Mm. And that's a hard thing to come to, Mm. um, that this is the best idea that I had, Mm. you know, because that was the only thing that I could do to feel okay Mm. on that day. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Just to sort of get to some sort of feeling of, I don't know, normal. (laughs) So, yeah, to to get to that, that thing. So, you know, you know, coming back, you know, back around to, you know, looking at my daughters and that, that yeah. little light of conscious, conscience sort of coming up and seeing them and then at that moment where I, I was able to be open to going to South Pacific private um, and and that I didn't know it was available. I didn't know any, I didn't know the 12-step program was available, that people were actually sharing about this sort of stuff honestly between each other. I had no idea about that stuff. That you weren't a special snowflake and the fact that this actually happens pretty much word for word to a lot of people. Yeah, I thought it was very, very special. <laughs> and actually I had really special help. I started uh, people around me saying, you need help in 1991. Oh, so that started... What is it, 15 years? I was about the same, actually. The first person who I loved me mm. desperately, mm. like we loved each other, mm. said to me, you really want to have a think about what you're doing? Well, this is <laughs> like, what is this? Do this to yourself all the time. Yeah. Ah, I'm not my dad. Yeah. Mm. 15 years. <laughs> 15. 15 big ones. <laughs> and and I think that's kind of runs along the line. I, I hear about, you know, relationship, when we're in a relationship with anything, really, whether it's with ourselves with our partners, quite often it's talked about as the seven-year itch, right? Yeah, and then some. there's some, got to be some sort of ev- ev- evolving elements in the relationship that need to take part for that relationship to go deeper on the seven years after the seven year, or around that seven-year, eight-year, whatever. And then there's another one that mm. comes around, so to either est- establish a deeper one or separate, you know, you have that seven-year itch, <laughs> So it makes sense it's 15 years at some point because it's all about relationship with ourselves. this one, well, with the, with the substances, with whatever it is you're using, but ultimately it's this, this relationship that needs to sort of needs attention. <laughs> so we're sort of running away from each other. So, those, so that makes two, two times seven for both of us. It took us to kind of... Going to come to some I, sort of. I don't know about you, mate, but I doubled down at halftime. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I really, I really did. Yeah. By the end of it, it was very, it was very clear yeah. that I had to, you know. But I, you know, I guess what kept me out, and I wonder if this is the same thing with you. What kept me out of getting help was the the shame of if I go get help, that means I need help, and I don't want to be the person that needs help, mm. so I won't get help. Mm. And I wonder if you know that had kept you out or kept you from seeking help? Um, I didn't know how to ask for help. I just didn't have that language in me yet. Right. It's a sort of a new language altogether. It was had to be learned. Um, Which is interesting for me because you were one of the first pro surfers to actively start working with 
trainers to, you know, do cross training, to develop mm. musculature outside of surfing. Mm. Now it was like, what's he doing? It's like, you, know, you were the only guy doing it. And now everybody's got a coach. Well, you know? I, I think, I think addicts, alcoholics, whatever you want to call a disease, this disease comes and expressed in, in, in 700 billion, you know, what is it? How many humans on the planet? So yeah. expressed, right? Yeah. And, and I think some of the most creative, most extraordinary human beings on this planet that have lived on this planet have ex had their disease. Ex this We call it disease. I, I don't know what to say. It's just an entity that comes through mm -hmm. us and, and expresses itself so we can focus in it and, and do what we need to do and actually get really good at what we're doing. A lot of it. And I was listening to a podcast just recently, uh, Michael Gervais. Oh, he's great. Uh, Finding Mastery. Um, I've forgotten the, the, but it's about perfectionism. Yeah. And it's a brilliant uh, listen. And uh, and it picks up on uh, something that I really suffered from. And it can be attached to something that will come from a part of a, dis a bit of an imbalance sort of, yeah. you know, care when you're a kid, you know, sort of trauma from when you're a kid. So perfectionism comes up. Right. And it came up for me and expressed through me and I wanted to get really good at what I was doing. I just wanted to get really good and I'll do anything. And and surfing, it's, it's a super healthy thing. Like it, 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 it divinely sort of lifts your body and your spirit and, and it just makes you feel so good. And it actually builds your body. You know, if you've got a body that's ready to build and it and it responds to it, and you've got all the all the all, all the makeup to do it, it'll it'll really allow the body and the mind to express itself in a beautiful way. There's no doubt about it. I see it all the time. But for me, it was really like there was all these stepping stones all of a sudden placed ahead of me, and this structure of competition, which I, I wasn't really a competitive surfer when I first started surfing. I just did it because it was fun. <laughs> just, yeah. But then all of a sudden there's all these things that sort of happen that I got kind of tagged into it. Not only did I have a really competitive brother, older brother, it was just 24-7 competitive, but I bit in and, and it started to kind of express itself through competition and I got real good at it. But, you know, along the way, um, you know, I just couldn't get enough. <laughs> like, uh, you know, and I, I, and, yeah. and I couldn't control, I remember trying to control my performances and it just was, it was brutal. I learned that I couldn't really control it, but I kept trying to control it. And I think if, if drugs didn't ignite the addict in that way, um, the addict would have probably found its way because underlying all that stuff, there was trauma. Um, there was trying to express itself and so on. Uh, in certain different ways, but as soon as it sort of felt that sensation of, you know, I think generally speaking when I heard about this from a, a therapist talking about, you know, being below the line, subtly below the line, there's your nice, you know, your happy medium, uh, your character sort of moving along in a, this line. Uh, you sort of, you're not feeling good or bad, you're just in the nice space mm -hmm. and you're, uh, well, I might have been just a little below the line for the most time, to right. sort of buy something within my system. Yeah. When I touched a drug like cocaine, methamphetamine and so on, it sort of put me above the line. So I went, ah, so the jigsaw puzzle fit. And, uh, and it fit so nice that I could actually engage more, which I just wanted to do. Yeah. I love engagement. I love people, and I would just love that. Let's get in there and engage more. That's fantastic. But and that's what surfing did for me too. It helped me, you know, come out of myself and engage with people and get involved and and in a bigger world. Thank God for surfing. But when it sort of turned, when this this part of me that wasn't seen as I evolved and tried to grow up. I don't think I really grew up, <laughs> by the way. Still trying. <laughs> Still if there's If there's any professional sport in the world that encourages encourages its greatest athletes to, I mean, it's the only sport, really, yeah. where you literally just go out there and play. Yeah. You literally play. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. 
you're not yeah. trying to fight anyone. You're not no. trying to get a ball from here to there. You're just yeah. going out there to, yeah. to be just, playful. Yeah, and, and, and artistically <laughs> play on the wave. And, yeah, and, and, and just play. It's, it's and amazing. just enjoy yourself and just go. As a great man. No, yeah. no other sport that lets yeah. you do that. And, and then uh, reward uh, you for it. Yeah, and <laughs> it used to confuse me sometimes. I get to do out, go out here and do this for my job. And sometimes it would be going, I'm out here trying to do my job. These people are in the way, you know, and, yeah. you know, to get a bit hectic, you know, <laughs> in the 80s particularly. But when the addict sort of, you know, doesn't want to be seen, you know, it starts to express itself through the use of something that is damaging me, um, the shame. You're talking about shame and guilt. That starts coming in on in spades. And that the fact that I can't, you know, God, I just... Why do I want to kind of stay up when everyone else is, like, done? Why do I want to go and get more? Why do I want to call the dealer? Why do I want to, you know, like, just go that much further? And, like, how come it's okay for me to do do it day in, day out <laughs> for a little, for a while until I'm completely toasted, where everyone seems to have, oh, I'll have a couple of those and then I'm done. So that was presenting itself more regularly as the the responsibilities of a life outside the sport started yeah. to sort of play on me. Just listening to you then, you, you touched on something which I know that, you know, mm. Johan Hari's written about in his book, Lost Connections. Mm. Um, it's very much, it is not only a connection with yourself and being comfortable with who you are, but it's connecting with other people. And mm. if we have not kind of figured out how to safely connect with other people, uh, which was, as I described before, it's mm. what beer gave me, mm. you know, Oh, it's this thing. Oh. Now, I can, now I can talk to you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> or if we're not able to connect with ourselves because it's something that happened to us when we were younger, mm. because there's something icky there that we don't like going near, mm. then, then we're in, in trouble. So what yeah. would you say about for people who are listening around, around, I guess, traumatic moments or, you know, big T, little T trauma, whatever it is, mm. like untreated, mm. like it's going to happen. It's, you can't stop it. It could have nothing to do with you. It usually has mm. nothing to do with you. But untreated. What can happen if it's you know if you if you're walking through life with trauma from when you're a kid? Mm, well, yeah, like um, <laughs> it's a big one. It's so individual because it's how you res how we responded to those moments that happened. That um, it's not the actual thing that happened. It's how we responded inside, yeah. right? So that made us sort of turn, uh, you know, get that that imprint into the nervous system. So it's it's going to come up and it's like whack-a-mole, right? You know that thing? just keeps coming up mm. in some way, shape, or form. I used to play in Grundy's. <laughs> you played it in Grundy's. That's good. That's where I played it. It's the only place I ever played it. Yeah. I think that was one at Dreamworld eventually, but that's no. where I played it. I played yeah. in Grundy's. Yeah. Bang, bang. Yeah. And it comes up as, as a, the memory sort of imprints and it sort of comes up if it's a powerful one. Yeah. And they talk about PTSD, you know, today... I mean, in back, you know, when I was uh, six, I, I lost my mum really slowly, you know, like it happened over a year and my brain wasn't formed emotionally. Uh, with that hardware, it wasn't there. So no, no wonder I had difficulty having a relationship with women. I just struggled uh, allowing them close to me. Very, very tricky. And I just, it was, it was terrifying. And um it wasn't, a, you know, till I came into recovery where I could, you know, drop all the, 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 the substances and then start to look at it. And we need help looking at that stuff. We can't, you know, go with this alone, <laughs> right? We just, we, we need to sort of go on the adventure tour yeah. within. <laughs> An adventure right? tour. An adventure tour yeah. within and, and see it. But the cosmic laugh here is that, I, that I've had, Three daughters. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that. Like <laughs> right? that's. You better learn this now, Tom. It's like <laughs> get in there, learn it, get in there, and figure this out because yeah. you got three beautiful um, women, like they're young women expressing themselves, and they're going to keep coming up with stuff, and you're going to have to be there for them, and so, uh, and, and you don't never know what form that's going to take. Yeah, but I definitely, you know. I hope I can be mature enough. <laughs> because, well, that's, uh, but that's the thing, comes, you know. You know, but that's the thing, and it's a, it's yeah. a it's a trick. But early on, when 
and you know, people may not understand this part about about addiction is that ultimately, well, at least drinking, at least, and I'm sure it's the same with you know mm. um, amphetamines. Mm. It shuts, it disconnects the memory uh, uh, from the action uh, emotionally. So mm. you can remember that some shit went wrong, mm. but you don't connect your action to the shit that went wrong. Yeah. So you don't feel that, oh, fuck, I really fucked that up. I should probably do better about that. You don't have that. Ugh. So you, that's why you do the same fucking thing the next time you are me and you drink tequila or anything. <laughs> and so what happens then is when I stop drinking and using, mm. uh, oh, now I have to start again. So I started drinking like that when I was about 14, right? Mm. And um, so I've got, I had to start again at 36. I had to start, essentially, here I am, I'm 36, and I've got a 14-year-old brain yeah. ability to look at the world. Mm. It was hard to figure that out. Mm. For someone who's, you know, you mentioned perfectionism, someone who's like mm. arguably like found the pinnacle of the pinnacles of mm. the sport they've chosen, what was it like to be faced with the humility of like, oh, man, I don't know how to do this. I'm going to have to learn. I don't, I don't like not being good at this. Yeah. Well, um, just the position that I found myself in that I couldn't stop um, and that I was actually – using and saying the word God help me when I don't, didn't like the word. I didn't know what I was praying to. It was a prayer. I, I never said a prayer in my life. <laughs> you know, I, I, I was like, God help me because I knew that I couldn't get enough of it and I was going nowhere. Um, I was frying myself. I could feel it. I was feeling like crap, like weak. I couldn't keep a conversation with people because I couldn't. And my memory was so fried that I, I, I was trying to kind of keep the conversation. It was such a simple thing. I could never remember. It was just, I go, oh, my God, I'm in a lot of danger. I felt in danger. And, and, and I remember that I was just getting enough of recovery in me through the 12-step the fellowship that I was sort of offered the hand of the 12-step fellowship and the kind of love around me that I didn't, connect to at all I was actually rallying to kind of guide me towards this person who became my first sponsor in Narcotics Anonymous um, rest in peace Muzz he, fantastic first sponsor he he kind of took me to my first meeting and I think it was like August in 2006 early September where I first started going to meetings in my hometown oh, I'm freaking out going Someone's going to get know me, you know, like, you know, like, I was just, I was freaking out. That's the shame, isn't it? That's a shame. Dude, I was, I was going I to the another meeting, country. Going, I was going to, I was going to another fucking country yeah. and I was terrified that someone recognised me. But I, I knew, I just, it didn't make any sense that I was, had this beautiful life and this was happening to me. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I was like sitting in these meetings going, I, I was so mad. I couldn't hear because my thoughts were so crazy. But... I could just identify with a couple of words, just little bits of sentences that were people were saying and that people were being honest about what was going on. And I was just going, oh my God, I hadn't been honest about anything <laughs> for a long time. So to be honest, something was happening in those rooms without me actually bringing it in mm. uh, that I didn't know about. And, and that was, again, it was something a lot bigger than me. I kind of sensed it. Yeah. But I didn't, uh, I didn't, uh, but a part of me, that little conscience, that little flicker yeah. that was still there and that we're trying to snuff out was going, that, that, that's the, maybe the spot, Tom. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> that's the, and I've been trying to do it by one-on-one -on -one with uh, yeah. counsellors and therapists over time and I, and I knew I could just work it, you know, I could stick the masks on and. Say what you needed to say. Say what I needed to yeah. think. Get out of there. Keep people off my back. Yeah. And, just get, and, and the attic was going, <laughs> you know, like, I got you now. It's kind, it's kind <laughs> of interesting. It, I'm, I'm still, you know, I still have to keep an eye out for it. I'm sure you yeah, do too. Absolutely. I have all this hip surgery I had, I had I did without painkillers because painkillers oh, were part of the last wow. couple of months, right? Uh, yeah. Or Panadol. Panadol. Panadol and Nurofen, that was it. Mm. But after, well this, after the first surgery, well, I had, I had to, man. Because yeah. after, and I know why. I even told the people after the mm. first surgery that I had, they gave me um, Tepentadol, which is a synthetic opioid, because mm. I told them 
everything. I had to tell them everything because yeah, yeah. I was like, don't give me anything that's a problem. Mm. And when I took the first one after I got back from the hospital after first surgery, I felt it come up and I use those words because it mm. wasn't, I didn't feel the drugs kick in. I didn't feel the pain go away. Mm. I felt the drug come up. Uh, all right. It's very like different, that. very that, different way of exactly talking about it. That's exactly how it, it happens. changes my relationship to this feeling, mm. right? And in the space of a, less than a breath, my brain went, okay, so there's 13 more and this, I've got fucking this many days. I'm going to take that white constant, the GP. I'll go to the other one around the corner. It's going to, they don't know me. Da, 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 da. And my brain already knew exactly what I was going to say to the GP. And I just passed the packet to Audrey. And I See, said, we are- unless I really need it, hide it from me. <laughs> Uh, the most creative, <laughs> when we want to be the most creative, take the most initiative faster than anyone else on the planet <laughs> and, and plan it perfectly to the T and you'll make it happen. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's, it's incredible. It, it, Whereas it, if, it's, if it's got something to do with someone else, oh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> you know, I'm going to do something for someone I, else. I was, I was yeah. a master at it. But so... People might be, you know, people listening and they may have their ideas about about addiction, what mm. addiction might be. What do you think, particularly with amphetamines, mm. what do you think is the biggest misconception about that? Uh, that it that it's 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 seedy. Um, it's a, it's only for the seedy crew, like it's only for the real down and out seedy um Part of town. It's, it's, it's not, even in the language, like we, it's a glass Barbie, is what we call, you know. Right, we yeah. call it it's the glass Barbie. It's the glass Barbie. Well, yeah. there it is, the glass Barbie. Mm. I mean, it's uh, amphetamines, are literally, we've got it in our, in our makeup. We've got the drug in us anyway. We don't need it. Mm. So, but we can um, double it up in the system and, and actually become more, um, for a moment in time, become more effective and more clear about what we're doing decision wise we can we can get more productive we become more um, just more of everything comes in and you become very clear about what you need to do about whatever's in front of you mm -hmm. so it's a very very alluring to those who want to be productive in life and so the the thing is this drug will be is everywhere it's not just in this thin slither of oh they're down and out. There's a he's on ice, you know the ice. It's the ice. It's the ice. You mm. know oh isn't it just a horrible drug? Da 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 da. It's not the drug. <laughs> it's never been the drug. It's the person that it touches. And if they're in a situation where they're not not looking at and they're not aware of themselves and what's going on and they touch something like this, it will take them. Mm. It, will, it will take them for a, quite a ride. And until you address it, it will keep taking everything away from you. So it, it, it's, it's very, very clear. The evidence is very real. <laughs> and uh, I'm watching it at the moment with, with someone who's quite successful. Uh, they've reached out for help. They're business person, very successful in what they do, and they're struggling. They can't stop. They w it will take take the businesses away. Um, it'll take their his relationships away. It, it'll and I and and I'm watching this situation, and I learnt this prayer in the rooms of AA. But for the grace of God, there go I, and I'm really thankful for that prayer, because. I try to control him <laughs> otherwise, and I need that prayer. The prayer is a very, very powerful prayer yeah. when we see someone suffering and we can't, we can't, all I can do is give him my support mm. and, and the fact that I've been there. And he, that's why he's reaching out. <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting you mentioned that it's, it's not, that the story we tell ourselves is that it's, oh, it's only the scuzzy part of town or it's only like people who are, you know, l you know, living in this particular form of housing or whatever. <laughs> it really doesn't care what <laughs> postcode you live in. It does not care no. how much money you make. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you make a lot of money, you're probably in far more danger because the bottom financially isn't there. Well, uh, I don't know um, like how mu uh, much the last big haul was, but the volume of methamphetamine coming into the country 
right now would be, God knows, 10 times that, which was the last haul. I don't know, it was a massive It's in the haul. hundreds of tons. Yeah. So where's that going? So they, they're they testing the sewerage water, not the people. They're <laughs> testing the sewerage water to yeah. find out which where. Where it's. And it's like that's how mm. it, it just everywhere Mm. This drug is, and it is mm. so extraordinarily addictive. There was a mm. guy. I, if you could speak a little bit about that, because mm. from what I know of it, is that there's a there's a guy that I met early on in my journey, and he had gotten clean and was huge in the gay scene before mm. it kind of crossed mm. over into kind of the straight mm. world, because it was quite associated yeah. with with sex. Yes. Yeah. Oh man, mate, it my. Gets I can I'm, if you need some wood cut, yeah. you can come and talk to, if you need something very, if you need some yeah. diamonds split yeah. in two, come give Damn. me a call. Yeah. I was there. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And so that's why they would use it. And yeah. this guy, he went out on a, on a grinder date, mm. knocked on the front door, the door opened, the boy went, and he blew, he just mm. inhaled and he blew it in his face. And that was it. He was out for another two years or something. There you go. Fucking Easy. terrible. I can imagine that. And. If there, like I said, um, if there's if there's something awaiting in the background that you're not aware of, and you touch something that sort of insatiates, if it's something that's causing kind of discomfort underneath you, underneath you, you're not quite sure, something informing each day, something that kind of kind of dragging you down, or something that's sort of emotionally not being seen um, or not being expressed. It's being held down, trying to sort of control it in any sort of way. And then <clears throat> something comes along like this. It could be the other way too. It could be opioids um, on that sort of spectrum. But particularly this sort of thing can come along and sort of give it, give you some sort of space from it. So you, you sort of, oh, I don't have to, I don't feel feeling that anymore. Oh, gosh, I'm going to go for that. And and that, and it sets up just a pattern, and we're just a bunch of patterns walking around, right? We are just a bunch of patterns. <laughs> I haven't even seen this movie, but the Matrix. Every time I hear about, you know, all of what the Matrix, you is dig about, it. I can't wait to see it's it. It's one of my favorites. I watch it once a year just to yeah, watch it. Yeah, yeah. So a good week. it's going on in, inside us. So yeah. it's it's playing out, and we're connected to people, and our closer people and we're just patterns but it's true it's as you just and, uh, described it's it's getting space from the discomfort mm. it's getting space from discomfort yeah. so what would you say about what it is to turn and be with that discomfort because mm. this is a thing that you know i certainly did and it sounds like you did as well tried to put as much as i could to avoid getting anywhere near mm. it for so long and every time i avoided it got bigger and scarier and worse mm. what would you say about what it feels like, what you think might happen when you turn and face it, and what actually happens? Uh, what it turns out uh, in the end is that um, what we've been looking for all along is love. It's the one healing element in the universe that actually allows us to move toward it for the first time in our life. And that it's that endless whole sense of being supported into the trauma. Gabor Mate wrote a beautiful book just um, recently called uh, The Myth of Normal. And I think that he's got some great, uh, he's got some great um, observations of human nature and he's worked directly with it. So he's got a great command of what's going on. But uh, trauma itself, when I've read that book. It was really uncomfortable reading that book for me. But um, moving toward it, having having the support, the sense that, that, you, that there's love involved with that support that, you know, that comes along and let, that sort of tends to hold you in, in that space where you can actually sort of be with it, it tends to dissolve on its own accord. It's not... It was so long ago, this thing that happened. It's no longer, and the system itself wants to get rid of it. Our nature wants to discard what's irrelevant. Our, our nature, it's just, we are nature. And nature's just gonna discard whatever's irrelevant, <laughs> right? A tree um, loses its flowers and they fall on the ground. They're irrelevant to the tree. They become more relevant to the earth then. 
and then they do the cycle back through, enrich the earth. And so this is what happens. Then the trauma becomes informing at a very, very enriched, earthy space uh, once it's sort of, does that make sense? Yeah. And so it sort of comes back and now what looks like you've been dragged into the worst position in your whole life turns around and becomes the most informative and most bright informative part uh, of your life. Like it actually starts to become vibrant yeah. in its form once again. So you come out of this, you think the whole world's coming around, you're going to lose your best friend and like the thing that's been supporting, even though it's been fully Kicking, yeah, kicking your it's your ass. identity. It's part of yeah. your identity. It's part mm. of what, like, mm. certainly you know what can sometimes drive you even. Mm. You know, so um, Eckhart Tolle, you know, um, the great spiritual teacher, talks about that. Our greatest moments can inform our greatest, yeah. you know, the, the the bottom the bottom of the which, which it did for me. Yeah. It informed that. Because my ego just went, oh, I can't do that, I can't do that, oh, I'm going to go down, I'm going to head, head south as fast as I could. And then that gets cracked and then you come back out and start to move in the direction, hopefully. Now, <laughs> hopefully. Yeah. It's not a smooth ride. Yeah. So it's not a smooth ride and not for the faint-hearted. So, but I think the one good, the great thing about and so, such a valuable um resource is is both the you know places like south pacific and the 12 step fellowship if you can avail yourself to sitting with people that's the whole thing for an hour and just listening yeah extraordinary things happen my uh m my man who guides me an uh, extraordinary bloke called david he's fantastic yeah. one of the steps is a fifth one mm. and you sit down in a very quiet place to you and you talk about some stuff that you otherwise would never say anyone ever in the world mm. and he says it's okay man like this means you don't forget it like all this stuff is mm. still this mm. but now i know about it mm. so it's now off your hands but now you get to remember this mm. and just keep living your life in the other direction like it's never going to leave you yeah but you get to live your life here's the best lines like look, i will good news mm. you get to live the rest of your life not being that guy anymore mm. and like you're right, it doesn't leave you, mm. but it informs mm. you to then become a, a version of yourself that you didn't even believe existed. Mm. Um, and you is, couldn't have yeah. even imagined it. No, fuck that. That's I thought thing. it was a fairy story. I thought yeah. it was a fairy story. It's yeah. like you obviously yeah. you're making up a joke. Yeah. Like there's no, 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 no. I know what happens when mm. I drink beer is what happened on the telly. Mm. Alan Board is there, Tomo's there, and mm. a girl in a bikini shows up. Yeah. That's what happens. <laughs> yeah. Never did. But I believed it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. How do you feel? You know, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like yeah. Suddenly I'm having a beer in the changing chairs yeah. with clients. Like uh, uh, alcohol marketing's got a lot to answer for. Bro. Oh no, they know what to <laughs> they know what to do. Marketing in general has been extraordinary. Mate, <laughs> oh, man, tell me about. It. Yeah. Tell me about. It. So to, to, to go, we're talking about like South Pacific private. It's a it's has outpatient facility, mm. but when people it's like, oh, I, I'm going to go in. I'm going to go into rehab, residential rehab. Mm -hmm. To get away, put some distance between yourself and it. Why is that important? Why is that important? Well, our lives, you know, in our family, it could be in the in, – because it's, it's, it's a whole dynamic that you're living within. It can be con uh, overwhelming and consuming. And, it, and we've, we've actually moved away from – making a decision about for ourselves around anything. In fact, addict, the addict will put the decision on everyone else. So, uh, so you've put decisions off, like to do something about something that's inside you. You're going, oh, I can, well, it's someone else's fault, you know. They can sort of, you know, I'll, I'll wait till this happens. Oh, well, well maybe I'll, I'll wait till tomorrow and I'll do it then, you know. And then, you know, well, it's like, you know, <laughs> anytime you try and do a, a New Year's resolution and it's like, just, you know, Boxing Day, and you find, well, maybe the day after Boxing Day and you're just really hurting and you're just going, oh, okay, New Year's resolution, I'm planning this out. And you give a little gap between that and the day and all your demons come out to play. 
Yeah, right. And that happens at all these little different levels it's so to the point where you're in this family dynamic or you're in the, this, this, the way of living that you're in mm. that the demons are constantly coming up. That, well, if you like to call demons, but it's just the, uh, the, 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 the dis-ease of, of this condition and the people who've been living and, with and, it and that aren't been, you. And, uh, aren't yeah. and, they're, and it's kind of their fault. And then and then on top of that, they could be enabling you. I mean, it could be all sorts of all this dynamic going on. So we need to get respite. We need to actually either you make a full-on decision and it makes really clear sense and you end up in the in a 12-step fellowship, which is fantastic. And some people do. They get clean doing that and clean and sober. But, you know, the way things are, if we can get to a facility where you can fall apart in support, in really sound evidence-based support uh, uh, from a, in, in surrounded by professionals, people that can actually, you can start to sort of work in group, which we really need to because a lot of us have been isolating. You know, I mean, in fact, it is just an isolation. I did all my isolation. best drinking and using alone, mate. Yeah. I so, wasn't a party. It was me by myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so we weren't relating to, relating to anyone. Nope. So usually, you know, um, the South Pacific one's for three weeks um, now, um, but they've got a, 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 a sort of a step-down program, mm-hmm. which I remember doing. I ended up being in there twice that for six weeks. Because my therapist said, I think if you can stay in for an extra week, Tom, I'd advise it. And I've gone, okay. <laughs> I was actually enjoying it being in there at the end because I'd, I'd been through a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff had lifted off me. I felt lighter even though I was crazy. I still yeah. it doesn't just go away, right? Like in, but um, yeah, that early day, early days, and, and I was getting, getting some time and distance away from using. I didn't know what I was going to do. You know, I heard a lot of stories about people using the day they got out of it. Oh, man. And, and, I, and I, you know, that was, that could have been on for me. And, uh, and I thought, oh, I'll do, I, I'm starting to feel good now. And the fact that I had that distance, I kind of sensed that now I really wanted to. There was a moment in there where it, some, the penny dropped, I guess, if you like. And I started doing some practices of meditation in the morning, every morning, uh, on on my own um and and just becoming more engaged and hearing the feedback from other clients and so on in there and and making friends in there and sort of connecting yeah and naturally um and some vibrance was coming back in me and and I and I wanted to go back home like I wanted to go back home like me again and that's how I felt and uh, after a very very dislocated uh, time for probably the previous 12 months right. getting increasingly more dislocated and um, disconnected, dislocated. And so the step-down program, I went, right, I'm, I'm, I'm on for that. It was um, three sessions. Uh, it was like 12 weeks of it. So it was three sessions for three weeks, two sessions for two oh, yeah. for three weeks. Um, and I think a couple of sessions a week for another three and then yeah. one for the – and step down and then I stayed with that and just kept on doing. You know, my friends in in uh, Narcotics Anonymous, just, I, got, I just allowed myself to get towed in by them, you know. What about the, you know, you get out and then, hey, I heard you're out, mate. We're down to the, you know, yeah. oh, we're at the Newport Arms. Come on. Really, you know, my whole – Home environment was very uncomfortable. Um, everything was super uncomfortable. But yeah. the the meetings and my support were saying, okay, because I had to learn how to sit with discomfort. That was the big one too. That's really it, isn't it? It's learning how to sit. That's the big thing about meetings is you're sitting in the room. You're, being, you're literally being supported just by sitting there yeah. to sit there. And listen, like I couldn't hear a thing, but <laughs> at first, but um, hearing and hearing, really hearing you, um, was to come much later. But uh, the fact that I was sitting through meetings and not wanting to run was a revelation to me. Yeah, and it, yeah there's guys, there's guys I called mates. Yeah. I never texted or called after that day, and you know what time they yeah. never texted or called me. 
It was go. like, all oh, right, our entire relationship was not based on friendship. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> how, it's incredibly. It's pa- how how does that reveal? It's wild, it's, right? Isn't it amazing? Yeah. Um, I um, yeah. I ran into my dealer about six months in, and, oh. and uh, just on a roundabout, and uh, and I was driving all happy in recovery. I was got another this other working in a position in an office of all things, and with Quicksilver, and I was like, they're giving me a kind of a a job for a bit, you know, just to get my kind of active, they were really supportive and and I was just um, I'd done a little work at Monovale and I was coming round the back way of Warriwood and this and I hadn't seen my dealer, right? Um for and I thought I'd I'd kind of forgot about him. Uh well I actually had a good solid distance from him actually, six yeah. months. And it, it was just me on the road. I'm happily driving along. It's like eleven AM, beautiful day, and I'm going back to Balgala where the office was and I'm driving along and down, it's a T in a section, but it's a roundabout. He comes flying down from the left in his little yellow sort of little hot up car thing, buzzing along, coming down here like, oh, my God, that's my dealer. And we come in and enter the uh, the roundabout. He's coming, turning r- right, and I'm going straight through from his right, and he, we meet a- as he's coming to enter and to go straight out of the um, exit and I'm coming to enter, enter the roundabout and we stop and he's hanging out the car and goes, yeah, I'm going, hey, how you going? And you know what happens when you see someone that you haven't seen for a long time and it doesn't matter who they are, you go straight back to what you were, the last conversation you had with them. All of a sudden the memory in your body comes through and you talk exactly the same. That's why you've got an old friend from school yeah. that you haven't seen for years and all of a sudden, wow, it's just like we My were. My voice changes. I use words yeah, I haven't yeah, used in 30 yeah, years. Yeah. yeah. And and all of a sudden I'm in this conversation like I've just done, uh, I just, I'm, I'm going to do the deal with him. Wow. And I'm like looking at him and going, he goes, he goes, yeah, we're on for this afternoon, you know. And I said, yeah, okay, I'm in. What's your number? Because I threw it away. So I put his new number in my phone. It's one of those Nokia things, you know. And the next minute it goes, yeah, I'll see you this afternoon. I've made the deal. Like, boom. It's going to have six months in, right? And I, I pull out, go straight through the intersection, and I'm like, I'm sweating. I'm like, look at the phone, and i got his number. And I either save it or I delete it. And something in me didn't allow uh, it to happen, and I deleted it straight away. Looked in the rear vision mirror, the attic trying to save itself. Looked at his car go round the corner flying in the rear vision mirror. He's gone. And do I turn around, right? Do I make the turn around, try and chase him down? Number's gone. And oh my God, I'm I'm freaking out now. Oh my God, I'm right breathing so different. Everything's different. And then I just hit the number of my sponsor. That's the way. And he was a brick, it was like a bricklayer guy. And he, he was mixing some mud, you know, to proclaim he, he's on the phone. Hey, no, I'm mixing some mud. Just um, pray like fuck. <laughs> I've gone, I've gone, what? I'm like, prayer was all like just so distant to me at that point. And so I rang another person in and I, and he answered the phone and he was available. Yeah. And so that connection, I got to talk to him all the way to Bill Bilga- Balgala about that and then I went to a meeting that night and I shared it and and that sort of offloaded a whole lot of stuff but that was I was that close I Mate. wouldn't be here with you right now dude thank you so much for sharing that because I, mm. I, I, I I remember when I, the guy who took me to my first mm. couple of meetings I was so freaked out and so paranoid and people have just met me asking me for my number I'm like what do you want my fucking like yeah, I don't yeah. know you I'm not giving me my number <laughs> And he kind of said to me, it's like, it's a thing we do. We just share each other's numbers. And I was like, whatever, whatever. Anyway, later that year, it was Christmas Eve and I just got divorced. I'm in that big house all by myself. I'm like, I called 23 people in a day, like people that I'd met at one meeting in New York for five minutes. And I've got the number. I just had it saved with a code at the end of it to know that it was a person. It's like, hey, we met once. Have you got five minutes? Yeah, I've got five minutes. Isn't that amazing? 23 people. Because I've got taught program. before I pick up, pick up the phone. Yeah. Because what are we looking for there? We're looking for connection. And that's, that's what we get. Yeah. And, and, and isn't that's- that, Isn't it amazing how wild, right? we want to be there because we know what it's like when that someone calls. You just go, oh, okay. And I'll be in the middle of all sorts of stuff. Family say, hey, I've got to take this call. 
And that's, that's, like, that's like that's like scarier than any hold down story you could have ever told me about you know surfing jaws or something yeah. like this. And I and I had this thing just my, my life in front of me. Yeah, it could have literally at an intersection. Could have imagine that. So I'm like in December, I'll be 17 years. And so it would have been I don't know where you just six months in, Tom. I just you know and I've got these three beautiful daughters and they're doing their thing. You know the relationship with them would have been so different. For, yeah. for a lot of people looking at going into, you're getting treatment, mm. the treatment, particularly mm. a residential treatment, there's mm. like, oh, but I can't leave my family, I can't be away. Uh, yours was like over Christmas, like as, as full on as it gets. Mm. What would you say to people who are, you know, maybe thinking about it or someone that they love might be thinking about it, about what it is to be away from your family over a period of time mm. for that purpose? Because it's going to actually help any future that you're going to have. That effect, that ability to, to actually let go of, mm. of all the stuff that you're hanging on to, because again, that's another thing you're hanging on to. If it's been pointing, the the fingers have been sort of pointing you in this direction towards going to a facility that's going to help you get well. There's there's something guiding this happening that's much bigger than you. So uh, try to just go for it. Give it all you've got because it's just going to keep taking, right? It's already taking away. And you're on the verge of losing whatever's in front of you anyway. And all the necessary points are coming towards you to make a surrender yeah. to the healing that's, that's on offer for you. I think it's f fantastic that you can actually allow you, you get, a, get a chance to fall apart. That, that's the key. Right. Falling apart. Um, becoming vulnerable, um, probably for the first time in your life. Get a chance to fall apart because I certainly mm. I can uh, I relate to like it's all so bad. Mm. I want it all to stop, and I can definitely mm. understand if you've started to have some thoughts about well, I've got an idea about how I might make that happen. Yeah, not a good one. I'll tell you right now. But to be able to have some quiet, to have that moment, to have a look at it all mm. in a supportive way. And it's particularly depending if how much you've been mm. drinking and using, mm. you're gonna need it because it shits me to tears that um, you know you can do heroin mm. like you're trying to audition for the Rolling Stones <laughs> and stop. You'll get yeah. real sick, but you won't die. Yeah, alcohol and benzos. Yeah. They, if you stop cold turkey, if you're using it to a certain point, die. you'll die. Yeah, and you can't. There's yeah. a bloke I know who's like doing both. I'm like, bro, you you can't just stop. Yeah, you know, I know you really want to. You've got to be. But you, you, you got to be real careful here, man. One. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And it's and it's, so you're supported in that way as well. You're supported I, health health wise mm, to mm. Be, like literally keep you alive. Yeah. I'm just so grateful to have a conversation like this because when I was growing up, it's no way I would have heard two men talking <laughs> like this. Yeah. Fuck no, never. Heard of, certainly not someone like you. Yeah. Certainly like someone who's in your position, who's like the, the peak of athletic prowess. Like mm. you know the, this, you know idolized like four page mm. posters folding out with staples in the wrong <laughs> spot, stuck to a wall of you, mm. right? Mm. Talking like this, and I'm. You know, I, I you, you spoke about meditation earlier. You spoke about, you know, the, the feeling of surfing and what that gives you now. I mean, I made the joke yesterday that someone asked me, what was it like when, when Wolfie was born? And I said, well, the first moment I sniffed his head, what the smell of those pheromones mm. did in my brain, that's what I chased off every single bump I ever did, ever. Bingo. Yeah. That feeling <laughs> wow. was like, oh, this is what I wanted the whole time yeah. as I'm on my knees in the toilet in King's yeah. Cross, yeah. you know, <laughs> with a stranger. It's this. Yeah. Just want that it's connection. This. Yeah. So the life you have now, mm. could you even describe it to yourself before you stop drinking and using? <laughs> Look, the thing is, the beautiful thing that I'm open to today is love. I... And that's what I feel and sense with people now. It's that could not be done before. That, that wasn't available to me before. That has grown over the years, and it's f it's funny on on a material point of view. I'm I'm not as wealthy materially, you know. Um, but when I can actually feel love, that's another thing, you know. And actually, I can I can stick by someone. You know, I can be there for someone. 
uh, you know, close to me, you know, I'm sure, you know, there's some parts of me still that go, oh, God, try to pull away. But I know that part of me, you know, that wants to pull away. And I can step up to challenges today and move toward them rather than away from them, which I could, I mean, you think riding big, big, challenging waves, and I, that was part of the feeling, the extreme of a, feeling connected to something that I needed to get intensity, and that's that was a part of my condition. I don't need that anymore. <laughs> it's not a... It's not a part of the equation anymore, mm. even though I absolutely love surfing and I love every part of it. I love the ocean. I love the engagement it gives me and the fact that I connect with, you know, I can offer that, you know, I coach kids surfing and, and the connection I get out of it, the connection, you know, is an expression of love. And I think I couldn't, I can dream that up. No. So great you came around, man. Thank you so much for sharing my, what you did today, buddy. <laughs> my pleasure, Osha. Good did to we, see did you. Did we do too. it? You feel like yeah, we did it? I think we could. I think we could. Oh, we did. Yeah. <laughs>